Okay, I now want to talk about <clears throat> just very macro level, the steps if you are having to construct a preliminary measure for the purpose of selection. And I think one of the things to keep in mind again is those um, hallmarks, if you will, that we were talking about earlier of how do we actually measure or decide what is a good selection measure. So you want to have a good idea of what you're trying to measure. Is it a knowledge? Is it a skill? Is it an ability? You want to make sure that you know what it's planning to be used for. Is it going to be an actual selection tool? And what's it measuring? And how, how important is it to what you're hiring for? Or is it developmental? And then at that point, you want to also be thinking about psychometrics. So generally speaking, what we know as far as designing a measure. So for instance, continuous data is usually more easily uh, validated and usually gives us more fine tooth definition. So the ability to discriminate between different people. So if we can, we want to get those on at least Likert scales or some form of continuous or ratio scale. Also, more items, if those items are truly measuring the same construct, will usually give us a better picture of that construct. So these are all things to think about, but you also want to be thinking about the practical nature of it. So how many items do you want compared to how long it'll take to develop them, and also how long you want participants actually filling out your surveys. A final component, again, this is all happening before we even sit down and start to create a scale, but I think they're all questions you want to think about and have answers to, is also the EEOC issues. So are you potentially creating a measure that may actually result in um, uh, the violation of the four-fifths rule? So once you've thought about that, mapped all of that out, decided what are we measuring, how we're measuring it, what resources do we have, how long do we want this survey to be, then we start to get to the actual creation of the scale itself or the measure. And generally I'm going to start with a generation of behavioral samples or items by subject matter experts. So if we're creating, for example, a scale that's actually a behavioral interview, if we're creating individual items rated on a one to five scale, whatever it is that we decide is the method of the measure, we probably want to start with not only our own conception, because we're a subject matter expert as well, but we want to gather as much information as we can from the subject matter experts that either rely on this job or actually are incumbents to this job. So we really want to think about what does this job do, what is the specific part of this job we're measuring, and then we want to inform, educate, and train subject matter experts that actually do the work or are reliant on the work to create the initial pool of items. And we want a large pool. We want to be able to basically, it's kind of like with selection, the larger the participant pool, the better we can be at selecting the very best participants or the very best um, potential employees. Same with a pool of items for a measure. The more items we have, and we're not talking about generating just random items, but items that have been generated by SMEs, the larger that pool, the easier it is going to be to pick truly good items for a smaller sample to create the measure. We then want to evaluate the items for content and format. So we basically want to think about what are these items supposed to be measuring, and we're basically doing kind of a face validity, content validity um, issue there, looking at each item, also making sure that the items are in the format that we need them in, and again that gets to the methodology. Um, are the, all the statements um, worded in a positive direction allowing them to be used with a Likert, Likert scale, for instance? We want to consider the characteristics of the applicant pool, so who are going to be actually taking this measure at the end. Um, and a lot of that point is, would they understand the items? So a lot of times the subject matter experts are going to be incumbents or people higher up in the organization or industrial organizational ex experts. There does need to be a little bit of an evaluation of what would someone just coming to this job understand? So there might be some great items, but you have to have been on the job for a while to understand the item and the importance of the item. That's not going to be good for selection. So we also want to be thinking about that. And that's probably the biggest error that occurs using subject matter experts to create your initial pool of items is they will likely create some very good items that look and behave well on incumbents which will not be that good with a new applicant pool. We want to think about the clarity of the questions, we want to think about the grammatical correctness, make sure that they're understandable, Consider and also a consideration of bias or offensive portrayals of subgroups. And again, this can kind of creep in sometimes. This isn't necessarily just bias in the scale itself. Some of the actual items may be written by people, and in their experience, especially with behavioral samples, that may be very well written in the language that they're used to encountering in the workplace, but that language may not be appropriate to a wide distribution of a selection.
We then want to develop and administer the scoring procedure. So we want to figure out once we have this pool of items, what is the proper responses? Is there an objective or fixed response item? In other words, is there a right or wrong answer? Um, are high numbers always indicative of better predicted performance? Or are they open-ended, free response formats, essay fill in the blank? So how are people being judged? Are people actually answering behavioral questions with an essay? And then how will that essay be actually measured? So this is the point where you actually are asking, how are these items actually going to be graded, if you will? Once we have that initial form and have gone through that process, we want to administer the primary form of the measure. Now, this is where I'll also say that, generally speaking, I like to think of this as I want to start with a large pool of items. I want to get those items down to generally, I kind of rule of thumb, want about twice the number I'm aiming for. So if I'm aiming for a 10 item test, my preliminary pilot test is probably going to have 20 items, assuming I can find 20 solid items. Because again, this allows the pilot test to allow statistics to really dig in and get me my best performing items. Now, in a perfect world, we could pilot test every single item that was generated um, through an entire process of multiple pilot tests. And if you have that kind of time and resources, by all means, knock yourself out. Generally speaking, though, even getting one pilot test into a study, because a pilot test takes both time it takes the money to actually produce the pilot test itself. So you're basically creating a selection tool that's ready to be used, but it's not going to be used yet. The time of the people completing it, and generally you're going to be using it on an incumbent sample, So, or it's going to be co-used with a previous selection tool in a current applicant pool. All of those take time and money and don't actually generate anything directly for the company. So push hard for a, at least one pilot test, utilize it well. In other words, I wouldn't use a pilot test to just look at the 10 items that you think are the only 10 items you're gonna use if you want a 10 item scale. What if seven of them don't work? Now you're all the way back to this, the drawing board. So you wanna overshoot a little bit. You wanna pilot test most of your good items, but you also want to maximize the usefulness of it. You do wanna think about the demographics. So you basically want to measure demographics to kind of check, is my responses on this new survey, this new measure, this new selection tool, is it creating potential four-fifth violations? You do want to think about the motivation of the people taking the test. So do they know it's a pilot test? Ideally, again, this costs more money, but ideally you want to pilot test this on actual applicants, but make the company aware they can't use it for selection purposes. They have to use existing selection measures, but then you can actually look at it because that actually gets you what you're aiming for. You're aiming for predicting from new applicants that are motivated to take the test. If new applicants are used, at least you've got the right experience pool, but if they know it's just a pilot test, that data is not going to be used at all in their selection, they're probably not going to be motivated. And what often more occurs with pilot tests is we actually pilot test with an incumbent sample, which means they're not motivated necessarily to do their best. Um, their ability is probably higher than most applicants, and we have to consider that as well. Once you actually have the data, then you can revise or replace items in the form, data analysis, looking at the psychometric characteristics, reliability and consistency of score in the items, validity of intended inferences, item fairness, and differences among subgroups. So we're going to look at a lot of stuff here. First, we're going to actually just ask, is the items, if we have multiple items that are all supposed to be measuring one construct, do we have internal validity? Do we have internal consistency? We also want to look at the individual items. Are we finding normal distributions on each individual item? And are we seeing a decent amount of variability? In other words, do they differentiate individually? So we might have an item that's highly related with the outcome. In other words, it's highly internally consistent. So it's a good item from that measure. And then we look at it and almost everyone responds a five on that item. So it's consistent. It measures the construct, but it gives us no additional variation. That might be an item that I might replace with a slightly less internally consistent item that has better variability. In other words, there's not one answer we're looking for here. We're looking to create the best measure possible. As far as validity of the intended inferences, that basically means we're talking about the validity between its prediction and what it's supposed to be predicting, usually an, an organizational outcome like performance. And again, we do want that demographic information so we can look, are we seeing significant differences between various subgroups on their scores on this measure. That might be an indicator we have potential bias issue that might be legally actionable.
So how do we interpret the scores of selection measures? Generally speaking, what we're talking about is norms, and I already talked about this a little bit, that a lot of tests are either normed for one particular population or may have multiple norms. Basically shows how much of a measured characteristic a person has in relation to a normative group of relevant other persons, a kind of standardization group. So for example, the GRE is normed off of um, college undergraduates who have recently graduated or are in their senior year and are wanting to go on to grad school, which is actually a pretty elite pool looking at the world na uh, basically nationally. That's not a whole lot of people that's being normed on, and that's why I often tell um, undergraduates when they're taking the GRE that if, in their 50, if they're in the 50th percentile, that doesn't mean they're in the 50th percentile of everyone in the United States. That doesn't even mean they're in the 50th percentile of college students. That means they're in the 50th percentile of college students who honestly think they can go on to grad school, and that's not necessarily a bad place to be. So again, that norms and that standardization group is very important to understanding the scores. And that's what I also was talking about as far as knowing the group we're norming a test on or we're testing the test. So if we're doing pilot tests with incumbents, the norms of those incumbents are probably not what we want to use to actually create the bars or the selection tools or the value we want to see in applicants because their norms are probably going to be smaller. So once we have a validated scale that we're ready to roll out, we probably don't really have norms yet because any norms we would have would have been generated from that incumbent group. We want to see how this thing actually performs with new applicants. And again, the norms show the relative standing in the group, not what an individual score means. So again, it's not a raw score. It's usually a percentage or like I talked about, a S9 score or an S10 score. It's put on some kind of comparative scale based on not how people performed on their raw score, but what that raw score would look like compared to a standardization group. Norms should be accumulated and developed locally, so they may not start that way, but that's what our end goal is. They can be transitory, reflecting specificity to the point in time when they were collected, and they can change over time. So, uh, for example, we have to change the norms on IQ tests regularly. It's called the Flynn effect. Basically, we found that as we continue to do more and more standardized testing in education, as people tend to get more education, the norms of our intelligence tests, our cognitive ability tests, our G-tests, people's scores keep going up. About every 10 years, all those tests have to be renormed. And what happens is, is when the renorming happens, what used to be a score of 110 as far as your norm score might go back down to 100 if you're average. So example, if I took an intelligence test in the 1960s, and I scored 100. If I took that exact same test with those same norms 10 years later, I'd probably score 110. 10 years later, 120. Maybe even up to 130 30 years later. So again, my scores would go up, so we need to renorm the test. And again, any norms based on race, called race norming, were made illegal in the Civil Rights Act, so it is not sufficient. If you find group differences, you can't just create categorical protected group norms. The norms themselves have to be based on an overall sample of the people taking the test and applying to the organizations. So you can subnorm about experience or level in the organization. You can't subnorm about race or demographic categories that are protected under federal law. So once we have these norms, they're usually going to be some form of percentile score. They show the percentage of people in the norm group who fall below a given score on a measure. The higher the percentage score, the better a person's performance. So if we're looking at percentile scores, and by the way, these are not percentage. It's not a percentage of the people that are above and below because it's not based on the raw score. It's based on where your score would fall to a larger population. So there's an inference happening here. So if it was a percentage, that would be 500 people took this test and I scored above 90% of them. This means my score compared to a larger pre-existing normed sample, I fell in that normed sample at this range. And that's the difference between percentile and percentage. Percentage is sample dependent. Percentile is based on previously known sample that is being used for norming purposes. So again, if I'm in the 90th percentile, that means that compared to a normative group, a pre-existing data set, I scored above 90% but below 10%. Now, I might have taken that test with 30 people, and I might have been in the 95th percentage, 
So I might have scored well better in my sample, but my sample actually may have been a little bit underperforming compared to the norm. So we have to make sure we don't misuse percentile scores. The difference of percentile points may not indicate a real difference in people. The difference may be due to chance resulting from the unreliability of the test. Also, percentile scores are based on an ordinal scale of measurement, not a ratio scale. So again, a percentile is ordinal. So if I'm in the 90th percentile, that doesn't mean I have an equal interval from someone that's in the 89th percentile because it's not based on race raw scores and it's not ba based on a set sample. It is based on an inference from a larger um, previously existing data source. The other thing is, is that if there's only one single percentage point difference, a lot of times the error in measurement is much greater than that. So for example, if we look at the average test score that we actually do, so a 100 point test, whatever your score is, even if it's a psychometrically sound test, your real score has an error bar around it. It's probably, so if you scored a 90, what that generally means is that you most likely, your true score was somewhere between about an 87 and a 93. So that's about six points of variance. If you've ever heard a political poll that says, this person has a 55% plus or minus five, that means there's a whole 10% variance in that measurement. And that's why a lot of times when there's a very close race, everyone acts surprised at the end. Well, he had 51% and she had 49% and suddenly she won. How did that happen? Well, that's because neither of those were true scores. They were very good estimates of how popular the applicants were, plus or minus a certain percentage point. Most opinion polls are plus or minus three to five percentage points. So again, if I've got someone in the 90th percentile and I decide to choose them over someone in the 89th percentile, that may not actually get me the best applicant. I need to be aware of the error, if you will, in what percentiles tell us. So another way to look at this isn't percentiles, it's standardized scores. It represents an adjustment from the raw score, so it's possible to determine the proportion of individuals who fell at various standard score levels. It indicates in common measurement units how far above or below the mean score or any raw score is. Type of standardized scores include z-scores, and so statisticians love these. They basically put the distance from the normative group in standard deviation units. So if you had a zero z-score, it means you're in the 50th percentile. You're in the dead center of the distribution. If you had a z-score of two, you're two standard deviations above the mean. So you're probably in the upper 95 percentile. And if you're two standard if you have a z-score of negative two, you're two standard deviations below the normative groups mean. In that case, you're probably in about the third percentile. T-scores are adjusted so that all T-scores are positive. So T-scores are similar to Z-scores, but instead of based around zero, they're based around a center point on a scale. And the most common T-score is probably the STAY 9 or STAY 10, often referred to as just STEN score. Rank, rank ordering from lowest to highest. So again, if a STAY 9 basically is a distribution from one to nine, with basically five being the middle point. An S10 is from one to 10, with basically four and, or five and six being the midpoint of that scale. And again, these are ordinal. So if someone has a 10 on an S10, that does mean they have the highest, but that's a, about a 10% chunk of scores. And one person with a 10 may actually be at the 99th percentile, and the next person may actually be at the 91st percentile. So again, it doesn't necessarily get rid of the danger of not necessarily being able to distinguish, but because it's representing bands, a lot of times people feel a little more comfortable with this. So the difference between a nine and a 10 still has error around it, but it's a little bit easier to kind of lump people together. So for example, we're gonna look at everyone with an S10 score of 10 equally and then decide which one actually should advance. So it's kind of a way to get to the idea of banding, where instead of looking at the actual just mean or actual score, we're looking at everyone that fell within a band based on the error of that score. But again, we're not using raw scores, we're using these standardized scores. So again, all of these are based on the idea of a normal distribution curve, so we definitely have to make sure that that's what our score, our scale or our measure is doing. Almost all of the actual um, mass available selection tools out there are on a normal distribution to some form, sometimes forced.
And what that often means is that the raw scores may not be normally distributed, and that's why they're converting them into either percentiles, Z scores, T scores, S9 scores, STEN scores, to get them into a more normal distribution. So let's talk a little bit about reliability as we move forward. So, and again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on these slides because effectively we're covering a lot of this in other classes as well, and we've also talked about it in previous classes. So reliability is simply the degree of dependability, consistency, or stability of a measure of score, either a predictor or a criteria used in selection research. So what we're really looking at is if we're measuring a stable construct, whether it's performance, whether it's leadership, whether it's personality, we would expect that a measure that measures that construct should give us approximately the same score each time we give it to the same person. Predictions concerning selection must be based on the results of true measures of differences they have. So there needs to be consistency in results. We have to be able to depend on that measure and there has to be stability over time. So whenever we're asking, is a measure doing what it's doing? Our first question usually is reliable. Is it at least reliable? Now we want it both to be reliable and valid, but reliable is the first thing we're going to look at. It's also easier to identify mathematically. So again, just recognize that there's always going to be errors of measure. Um, any, any factor that affects obtained scores but are not related to the characteristic trait or attribute mean measured. And we kind of talked about this a little bit in our discussions, and that is that sometimes error is things we want to capture. So faking. Faking would be error. Faking would not be something we're necessarily wanting to measure if I'm trying to get at performance in an interview. But if faking is actually predicted by both cognitive ability, motivation, and the ability to read people's emotions and emotional responses, those all might be factors that are related to performance. So just recognize that when we're talking about error from a pure practical viewpoint, we really want to think also, is the error that important? Is it error that truly should not be measured? So for example, if I'm doing interviews in a structured interview and I find out that though the answers that are being given and written down, I can find no difference, for whatever reason the person giving the interview is always rating women lower. That's error I don't want. That's error that actually is a problem. But if the more energetic and extroverted people tend to get better reviews regardless of what they actually say, in other words, I don't find a difference in the written down responses in the structured interview, but I find that people that are extroverted tend to actually get higher ratings, and I'm hiring for customer service or sales, that's technically error. I didn't want to be capturing extroversion in those particular measures, but it might be error that's still useful to me from a practical viewpoint. So just recognize that every time we're measuring anything, what we're wanting is true score. We're wanting to get at the true score of whatever construct we're at. However, we're never going to be able to measure it directly because we're always going to have to be inferring it through the lens of our observations, the errors in our test, and also just the errors in state and traits of the person we're measuring. So there's always going to be error added to that. And it's true score plus error is actually what we obtain. And that's one of the other reasons we really want to be careful when we give someone a score, for example, 91st percentile, that we don't just automatically assume that they're better than the 90th percentile, because both of those scores have error. And if the person with the 91 had positive error, and the person with the 90 had negative error, the better person is the person with the 90, but I don't know that. So we want to be cautious around scores that are very close to each other, and we want to estimate how much error there is in our reliability of measurement. So the relationship between error of measurement and reliability of a selection measure. So again, what we have here is three examples where we have a measure with high reliability, moderate reliability, and low reliability. And we have someone's score. So the score they actually give us. And in this case, this, this is the same person. So the same person, their true score, not that we would know this, is a 50. We give them the high reliability measure, and that measure is probably going to put them at a 45 to 55, because our estimate of its error is about plus or minus 5. Now, if we give them one with moderate error, so in this case approximately um, 17 points of plus or minus, we're now getting a score from 50, 43 to 57 based on their, I'm sorry, um, error of 7. And then finally, the low reliability with a plus or minus error of 20, now their score is between 40 and 60. Now, I want to stress that if the only measure I have is that low reliability measure, I'm still getting some useful information. 
So if I measure this person and they are going to score between a 40 and 60, and I measure someone else and they actually score a 90, which is plus 70 plus to 110, I know the person with the 90 is better than the person with the 50. Their error, the, even if I have the most possible positive error on my true score of 50, that's a 60. And if I have the most possible negative error on that score of 90, that's an 80. So that's still 20 points away from each other. So it's not that I can't use this scale, but if I had someone with a score of 55 and someone with a score of 45 on this scale, I'd be a little worried. If I had those two same scores on that high reliability scale, there's still a possibility those two people are similar, but it's a very slim possibility. So hopefully this helps you kind of visualize the importance of not only our measurement, but the error in our measurement. The less error, the more we can trust the numbers, and the better comparisons we can make, and the better decisions we can make. So how do we measure, estimate reliability? We're basically going to creating some form of reliability coefficient, and this is usually going to be a correlation. It's an index that summarizes the estimated relationship between two sets of measures, and the higher the coefficient, the higher the reliability estimate, and the lower the error. So principal measures of testing and estimating reliability, and all of these are effectively, again, correlations or a form of correlations. First is just test retest. So we give the uh, in each individual the test, and then we wait a period of time Generally, 10 to 14 days is usually sufficient. You don't want to wait too long, but you also don't want to make it too quickly. You're basically trying to find the sweet spot between did they actually learn more and increase or decrease naturally in whatever you're measuring, which can happen over time, and we're wanting to get rid of the recency effect of them remembering the test. So you'll find different rules of thumbs. I think 10 to 14 days is usually sufficient, and then you simply correlate. So if we find a very high correlation between the test and the retest for each individual, that represents reliability. We can do parallel or equivalent forms. This includes creating a separate form. It can also be odds or evens. We basically are looking at different ways to compare the test. This would often occur also if we have a large pool of items. So I already talked about briefly that we want to start with a very large pool of items. And originally I was talking about getting it down to a standardized set of items. But we may actually have the goal of creating an item pool. So I might start with 500 items. I get those down to 100 approximately um, items that are approximately functioning similarly. And then anytime you take the test, you get a random selection of 20 of those items from the pool. This allows us to have tests that don't look exactly alike every time and also make it harder for people to kind of screenshot and get out there. If that's the situation, then you can do a parallel or equivalent form. You can pick our items 1 through 20 to items 21 through 40 to items 41 through 60 and etc. We can also look for internal consistency, so basically just how the items stack up within themselves. Probably the most commonly used here is Conbrax coefficient alpha. It basically is a set of multiple correlations that gives us a single value that tells us how internally consistent those items are. We can also use various forms of split half reliability, odds versus evens, first items versus last items. And again, if all of these items are supposed to be equally measuring a construct, we should find high correlations. We can also look at inner, inner rater reliability estimates, and that's what we're doing whenever we're actually having to have a human come in and rate answers, so usually open-ended answers. We can have multiple raters rate the same items, and we can see how reliable their scores are, how often they all agreed or were at least close in agreement on whatever the rating scale was. So let's look at an illustration of estimated test retest reliability. So again, we have test scores at time one, and then we have retest scores at time two, and we can kind of look at, you know, we're basically checking each individual person and how their scores varied from one time to another. So for example, the test the test retest reliability from time one to time two in case A. So this is actually, um, in case A, we're looking at a very reliable, basically the same test. We find 0.94, very high correlation, very high evidence for test to retest reliability. Case B was a different type of test. So we're comparing one test to another test, and in that case, we find almost no reliability. And that might be something we expect. That second test, case B, may very well be measuring something completely different than what we're actually trying to validate. And this also illustrates kind of a point that when we're looking at reliability, we often will start to move into looking for validity. So not only might I compare the same test 
test retest time one to time two, I might also look at how that test compares to non-related tests. So again, I'm looking for divergent validity, proof that it's not measuring other constructs that I'm interested in. So again, looking at maybe basic procedures for requirements for developing parallel forms. Again, I'm going to start with a large content items. I'm going to pr do preliminary item analysis, and then I'm going to create maybe a random sample of items for form one and a random sample, sample of items for form two. And what I want to do if I need parallel forms, if I'm needing a test form A, test form B, or maybe even more test forms, I need to make sure that those tests, generally speaking, perform very similarly. So that would be a parallel forms reliability estimate. And again, I'm going to correlate the same people's scores on form A and form B. If I have a pool of hundreds of items, I may actually have a much larger study ahead of me where I check basically random combinations of multiple forms, all making sure that no matter what combination of items you get, your scores should be somewhat similar. This is a representation of just an odds and even, so split half reliability. Again, I have a test with multiple items, 28 of them, half of them I look at as the even, half of them I look at odd, and again, if all of those items are measuring and are equal difficulty and are equally measuring the same construct, I should find a very high correlation between odds and evens. And again, I could do this also high-low. I could do this every three to every three. So one through three goes in the first set, four, five, six. However you want to do it, what we're looking at, though, is no matter how you chop up those scores into two equal groups, if the measure is measuring the same construct, we should find small differences in how they measure it in the same person. We should find high correlations no matter how I slice that pie. And finally, an example of applicant data and computing coefficient alpha. And like I said, I think the best way to think of coefficient alpha is it's looking at each individual item as it correlates with all other items. And then it sums all of those actual correlations together into a summative score. So how does item A correlate with all other items? How does B correlate with all other items? How does C correlate with all other items? And then it collapses all of those into a mean estimate of how much correlation there is throughout the entire measure. It also, with SPSS, can generate which items are the most interrelated and which items are the least interrelated, which can also give us information, for instance, of Currently, I have 20 items and a correlation alpha of 0.83, for instance, which is a pretty good alpha. But I can also find that SPSS might tell me if I remove items 4 and 7, that alpha goes up to 0.9. So those are the items with the least correlation, and they're actually dragging down my average. So I can also tweak the test with this information. So a descriptive summary of the major methods of estimating reliability is presented in this form. So basically, you know, I'm not going to walk through this whole thing, but I do think it's worthwhile just kind of taking a moment and reading this yourselves, um, either in the original PowerPoint slides or go ahead and just pause the video and just really get a feel for how many forms you need, what are the questions addressed, how do you do it, and what is the information that you're gathering, because each one of these methods gives us a slightly different picture. And this is just continuing that. So again, taking a look at the different methods. I really didn't talk much about the Cooter Richards um, formula. Basically, when we're looking at this, it's when we're not sure we have continuous items. So the Cooter Richardson um, is more usable for categorical. So basically, multiple choice. Um, it's usually uh, the Cooter Richardson 20 is more suitable for yes, no, or true, false items. So if you are in a situation where you do not have continuous data or qualitative data, the Cooter Richardson is what we would use in that formula. So how do we interpret these uh, coefficients? The co reliability analysis basically is just telling us the dependability of the data we use for selection decision making. And it also helps in estimating the amount of error included. So the extent in percentage terms to which an individual difference in scores on a measure are due to true differences in the ability measured and the extent to which they're due to chance error. That's what we're getting at. So for instance, if I have a reliability of coefficient of 0 0.90, that means it's pretty reliable, but it also means there's still some error. Um, the only way we get a reliability coefficient of 0 0.10 is if there is perfect reliability, and we wouldn't actually expect that. There would be actually something 
fishy, if you will, if there wasn't some error, because some error is completely beyond our control. It's individual differences. It's moods. So we're always expecting there to be some error. Now, just a quick note, and I've hit on this before, but this is the relationship between test length and probability of measuring the true score and test reliability. So generally speaking, the longer the test, the more reliable it is going to become. Now, there's two factors that are occurring here. A true increase in reliability and a statistical artifact increase in reliability. So generally speaking, what that means is that if you have a pool of possible test items and all those test items are relatively good, the more you give, the more you're going to basically edit out error. So one of the ways to think about this is let's assume that we do have 80 items that are all very related to the construct we're interested in and are all very well written, written at the same level, and generally speaking, are highly correlated with each other. If I give someone five of those items, if one or two of those items were ones they misunderstood, they have a disproportionate effect on error at that point. If they misread one, just one item, that's 20% of their response. If they miss key one item, so they read it right, they knew the right response, but then they marked down the wrong response, that's 20% of the variance. Now let's look at the test E with 80 items. If I mess up one item there, it's about 1.25%. So my personal errors, my errors in reading, my errors in understanding, my errors in responding, become much less impactful in a longer test. So, again, just adding items to a test alone doesn't get rid of this problem. But if the items are truly accurate, if they're good items, more items means that my personal, the person taking it, little variations and little errors is going to have less impact on my true score. There's going to be less error. Now, the downside of this, as like I said, is there's also the fact that there's a statistical artifact that because items tend to be somewhat correlated even when they're not. So it's very hard to run a correlation between any tests and actually get a zero correlation. So there's a statistical artifact here. If I have 80 items that are completely unrelated, I'm going to get I am going to get a higher estimate of the total reliability in that test than I would with five items completely unrelated. So the more items I have, I'm generally going to see a slight increase in reliability based on the fact that patterns will just start to emerge. So random noise is less likely to make a noticeable pattern in smaller items. Random noise tends to make small patterns in a large sample of items. And it's captured by our statistics. So I'm not telling you to worry about this too much, but just be aware that if someone tells you, well, test C was 20 items, and when we went up to test uh, D, which doubled the items, we went from a reliability of 0.50 to 0.53, see it's a better test, that's when you start being a little suspicious. That's probably just the fact you've got a longer test. Now, if going from 20 items to 40 items gets you a 17 point increase, well, that's probably more realistic, and then that's what we're showing here. This actual example is definitely showing a increase in reliability probably because you're getting closer and closer to truly capturing the construct with more and more items. And if you were wanting a highly reliable test, what this would also tell us is we need a full test of 80 items to get that. We also want to talk about the relationship between test question difficulty and test discrimination. And I'm not going to get too much into this, but we just generally want to be talking about how many people are getting the test the item correct versus incorrect. So again, if very few people get an item correct, that makes it a difficult question, but it also means that it highly differentiates top performers from lower performers. So if we're really focused on trying to find the very best people, we probably want difficult question, questions. Like, for an example, a question where only 10% get it right. However, if we're interested in, if we're not interested in differentiation, the next question might be an example. It's got a 50% uh, success rate. It really also depends on what you're trying to get at. So for example, if you're wanting to ask a question that most people are going to get right, but if they didn't get it right, they couldn't do the job, that means that it may not differentiate, but it's still a valid question to have on a selection test can you actually do this? And maybe 90% get it right, so it only discriminates a very small number of people, but the people it does discriminate do need to be discriminated against. 
So don't go, I'm, I'm basically advising to not be constantly chasing after all difficult items. You want to think about what is the overall test measuring, but also what does each item get at? And it's not a bad idea to have a few high discriminating items. Anytime I write a multiple choice test for a class, I usually try to have a pretty equal split of about eh, 30% fairly easy questions. In other words, if you attended class and you got, just got basic concepts, you're going to be able to get these right. But if you don't, I want to know it. I want to know if you didn't even learn the basics of the class. Most of the questions are going to be in the middle, fairly difficult, but not too hard. Again, you may have to study for it a little bit, maybe have to actually review the concepts a bit. But I'm also going to have a small number of items that only if you really dug into the material and understood are you going to be able to get right. And that allows me to differentiate between A, B, C, and D students for the most part. And I'm not going to be able to do that. If I made a test with all extremely difficult questions, well, my A students would get A's and everyone else would flunk. That's not necessarily what I'm wanting to do. So you actually ask, want to ask yourself, what am I trying to differentiate? And how will a combination of questions allow me to do that? Now, once we actually have a reliable test, we also have the ability to est estimate the actual error in individual scores. Um, and again, you're not going to run into these as much as you think you would, and you're not going to see them as much as you should. But it's one of the things that as an IO psychologist, you want to bring to the table that when you are telling someone this person scored a 9 or this person scored a 33 or this person's in the 91st percentile that you can follow it up but their true score most likely falls between the following range so you need to become an educator if you will of the need to actually pay attention to the standard error of the measurement so the standard error of the me measurement is calculated fairly quickly so basically what we're measuring is the standard deviation on the attained score and the reliability of the measure. That's what we're actually calculating here. So we're taking one minus the reliability. So again, the higher the reliability, the smaller this number will be. So one minus 0.95 is gonna be smaller than one minus 0.3. So what is the reliability? We're then gonna take the square root of that and multiply it by the standard deviation on our measure. That's going to give us the standard error of the measurement, which is basically a plus or minus score. That tells us whatever their score was, it's plus or minus the standard error of the measurement. So that shows us the scores are an approximation, so it's a, it's, a, it's a mental reminder that we're looking at more of bands and range. And the standard error of the measurement is not, an, it's also, it's an estimate. That means that someone could still be actually, their true score could be out of that range. It just means it's much more likely their true score is in that range. It aids in decision making in which only one individual is involved. So it kind of reminds us to be looking at the band. So how many people were within each other's error. Um, can determine whether scores for individuals differ significantly from someone. So if I do find two scores and they are not touching as far as their error measurements. So I've got a standard error of the measurement, for example, of five and I'm comparing a score of 80 and 95. So the highest that 80 would be estimated at is an 85. The lowest that 95 would be estimated as a 90. Full five point difference. I can be fairly confident choosing the person with the 95. But again, if I have that error of five and I'm looking at a score of 90 and 93, probably I need to look for something else beyond that score to make that decision because what I'm being told is highly likely these two people are relatively close in the same scores, just depending on the error in the measurement. It also can help us establish confidence in scores obtained from different groups of respondents. So finally, just the guideline for interpreting individual scores. The difference between two individual scores should not be considered significant unless the difference is at least twice the standard error of the measurement. And the reason, again, is the standard error of the estimate gives us the probability that someone's score is in there but there's still a chance their score would be outside. Uh, think of standard error of the measurement as kind of stand, basically standard deviation, but not standard deviation of the entirety of the score, standard deviation around an individual score. So again, if we go to two standard errors of the estimate, that means there's about a 95% likelihood the person's true score lay in that range. Before the difference between, two, two, between scores of the same individual or two different measures should be treated as significant, the difference should be greater than twice. So again, we just want to look at that and recognize that we often simply report one standard error of the measurement, which is again an estimate, to remind us to be thinking about these things. But if we're truly wanting to be confident that we are making a differentiation between two people, they should actually be fully apart 
two times the standard error of the estimate. So again, in my example of 80 plus or minus 5, there is a chance that person would be in the 90s or, early, or, or up to the score of 90. So 80 plus 2 times the standard error of the estimate, so plus 10 or minus 10. So 70 to 90. So 80, 75 to 85 is one standard error of the estimate. And pretty likely they're going to fall in that range. But they might be in the range of all the way from 70 to 90. And again, that 95 is probably in the range of 90 to 100. But to be completely confident, and again, not completely, but a lot more confident, I'd have to go, actually, they could be anywhere from 85 to 105. So there's still some overlap there. So if the person with the 95 was just having a really good day and got lucky, and the person with the 85 our 80 um, was just very unlucky that day or having a very bad day, I might still make a bad decision.